Visually evoked potentials were first noticed in EEG recordings in the 1930s. Uh, clinical EEGs date from uh, just fairly recently, you know, not 100 years ago, from a uh, German neurologist named Berger. And about 1929 was the publication. And by the early 1930s, they were doing e recording e EEGs in the United States. As you know, the visual part of the brain is at the back of the head. Everything at the back of the head is, is visual. And the primary visual area that visually evoked potentials are recorded from mostly is the central area, which if you feel up the back of your head to your inion and go up about three or four centimeters, that's the center of the visual primary visual area, area 17. O1, OZ, O2. Indian. This is a functional MRI of the visual area stimulated with a check pattern similar to what is commonly used in visually evoked potentials. And I want to show you this to show you the variation between hemispheres. This was recorded here, not at Moran, but in the MRI unit here at the university. Note the asymmetry. The hottest area is red. Notice the asymmetry at the cortical level between where you can record visual activities to a pattern. In his case, the hottest area is deep, d buried deep down three or four centimeters. This is why using electrodes lateral from the central area are very poor at detecting hemispheres. For one thing, once the signal leaves the cortical surface, the polarity fields start to tilt and you get false lateralization from on your visually evoked potential whether it's coming for the right or the coming from the right or the left side. Although commonly in the world, people put an array across the back of the head which is just, which is just a waste of time for everybody, but they do it anyway. If you present a sensory stimulus, that's this blip, flash a light, a changing pattern, uh, a click in the ear, and then take a period of the EEG from the brain following that click, repeat it, take another period, save each, add them to the next, add them to the next, add them to the next. That's how evoke potentials are recorded, whether they're visual, auditory, or somatosensory. They come from the EEG, or extracted from the EEG. This is the chronological order of visually evoked potentials. The way they were done until, oh, the middle 60s was a strobe flash only. Then they start adding pattern to the top of a strobe. And then the original invention of the pattern reversal visually evoked potential stimulus was a mirror system. It was really cute. One of the advantages of being older than dirt like me is that I knew most of these pioneers when they were alive 50 years or 60 years ago. Um, the originator of the pattern reversal response took two Kodak slide projectors and he had a pattern of a checkerboard in one and then the reverse of it in the other and he put a camera shutter in front of him. And that was the stimulus. So he back projected onto a translucent screen a pattern that the checks were in one position and then the, the, other, the next a fraction of a second later it was reversed and, and that's how he did it. And there were even these cute little sub suitcase systems that you opened the suitcase and it exploded out and it had two of these little, two little projectors shining it on a screen. This is how, how that was done before television monitors were used to do it. I had one. It would be wonderful to have it and somebody without asking me threw it away. <laughs> and then the pattern onset offset is the pattern comes on and then it goes to gray. I'll show you each of these. So, this is the stimulator, an old one of what's used for photic driving by neurologists, and this was the original stimulator for visually evoked potentials. This is what I was trained on. Even for ERGs, when I learned ERGs, this strobe lamp was put in an articulated arm, and patients were tested lying down with this over their, 
over their face, you know, a foot away or so. And then mid-60s, people starting adding a static pattern. And then the pattern reversal is this. The visual system really likes this. It likes sharp edges, what are called stop lines, and high contrast. The great thing about pattern reversal response is if I test everyone in this room, they, I get the same looking visually evoked potential. Whereas with a flash or pattern onset response, they're quite variable between individuals and more reflect individual fine in differences in anatomy of individuals. So this is the normal pattern reversal visually evoked potential, which is the handout. If you use the televisions until the, until the modern ones uh, that are faster and brighter, this is what you get. This is the classic. So you get this response that peaks around, a positive wave that peaks around 100. And everyone in this room yours, would look like this. I'm not going to go into this other than I'll mention that the, uh, the visual evoked potential is present at birth, but because your system's not myelinated, things are much slower. So you can just watch if you would sequentially test an infant from a few months of age all through up into grade, at least grade school, you could just watch the quote P100 start out around 180 or so and then improve 10 or more milliseconds a year so that by the time they're about first grade, it looks like an adult. You get full pattern responses by about six months of age, although with continued myelination of the optic pathways, it, the speed increases, like I said, for the first six or seven years. This is a study done, a thesis done by a person who's still here that was a friend of mine, has been a friend of mine for 50 years. He took about 20 people of each of these average age groups on the left and recorded the, the responses. And the, the only significant change you get in, until after fifth, age 55 is about a one millisecond slowing of, of the response. The biggest difference for people after 55 is look at the standard deviation jump. That's because of the big differences in aging between individuals, and the same is true on the development end in the big differences between the maturation of a two, three, four, five year old. This is a scattergram of all those patients I just showed you. Note, you get a big variation in lower grade school, and it's even greater than that before age six or seven. Things tighten up through young adulthood, and then the variation goes up again when you, when you get over 65 or 70. The pattern onset offset response is what I mentioned was from a blank gray pattern, a pattern appears, goes back to gray, pattern appears, goes back to gray. This is the preferred stimulus for any person that has nystagmus as part of their symptoms. The pattern onset visually evoked response is best for poor fixation, eye movement, malingering, deliberate defocusing, and, nystag and nystagmus, as I mentioned. So there are choices that have to be made. This display is inverted, it's from that same study that I mentioned showing the similarity in responses with no significant difference until after age 55. You can estimate visual acuity by using different sizes of pattern in the pattern of oak potential, but it, you can't do a better job than you can do. So even though it's cute that you can estimate a person's acuity or an infant's acuity by using two or three different sizes of, of patterns and 
creating a, a linear, compute a linear dis distribution of the response speeds and amplitudes, you can, you can determine acuity. Do you often get people asking you to do that? No, what no. You Usu like malingerers, oh. it's the, in fact, that's just it's the end. That's the end that you really get asked for, is malingerers. Uh, so if they're not so sociopathic that they've researched it and know that not to cooperate, if they cooperate and I use different sizes of checks, then you have evidence that that they're really not the acuity they're trying to to tell you. But I don't get asked for kid infants or anything. Back. We're blocking them. What? Um, but we've told them no. No, good, <laughs> good. Uh, for one thing, they, they have the attention period of a gnat, and they will, unless you can somehow force them to, to, to watch it, you can't get them to fixate for long enough and maintain fixation to get a response. Like ERGs, you cannot fake unless you refuse to do it. it like it's running a strip of your electrocardiogram. But visually evoked potentials for pattern require the patient cooperates and fixates. So uh, I've had, through the years, a lot of patients in malingers that come in and they know to pretend, but to either consciously defocus or look at the bottom of the screen instead of the screen or something like that. One of my, I can't, I guess I gotta tell you this one. They, it was, he was a VA patient brought in and he just came into the room like this. This was a long time ago when you used EEG machines to provide the amplification of the, of the EEG. And he just came in like this and we recorded the results. And as, as he was leaving the room like this, the EEG machine was over there and he went, are those my ERG, EEGs? And, and his wife hit him. <laughs> he was trying to get a blind compensation from, from, from the VA. And he went, are those my EEGs? Had another guy that that had a white white cane and he was like this and he said you know where are we going and I said well we're going right to the floor right below where we are right now but the closest elevator is down there in the in the middle of the building so we have to go down there and down the elevator and come back and he he said is there a shorter way and I said well yeah there's some stairs right over here and so he went to the top of the stairs like this he folded up his stick and went down the stairs like this and then opened up his stick again and, and, and continued on with this charade. <laughs> the classic use of visually evoked potentials, at least the pattern reversal visually evoked potential, similar to the classic use in full field ERGs, which was for retinitis pigmentosa, the classic use was to quantitate optic neuritis in multiple sclerosis patients. The pattern reversal VEP was invented at Queen Square, London, the National Center for Neurology and Stroke for Great Britain. It was a neurologist named Martin Halliday. And I visited his lab in the 70s there when, when he was using the Kodak projectors to, to create the pattern reversal. In classic optic neuritis, Usually one nerve starts before the other. So whenever I quiz patients that, and I always ask them, is it one eye or both? And of course, people, people think both is worse, but that's not true. <laughs> one is worse. <laughs> one, if having one nerve only is poorer prognosis at that point than having both. Classically, if you get a perfect patient like this, there's no amplitude difference. You just have significant slowing of one nerve. I'm going to run through some different examples. Sometimes there's a bilateral one. Just look at that middle column where it says P100. If you took a classic multiple sclerosis patient that onset was, say, 25 or 30 years old, 
and then you followed them and tested them every five years or, or so until they were 60 or 70. You would see first one nerve slowing, then the other one kicking in in six months or a year and also slowing, and then getting slower and slower as they demyelinate more and more through the decades. And after they're, say, 50 or 60 years old, there's enough demyelination going on that you also start to use, lose amplitude. That's definitely abnormal. Standard deviation is six or seven, six to seven. When you get past about 112, you're pretty sure that you're beyond two standard deviations. Um, the, uh, and especially in a woman, because women in general have a little faster responses than men. Unfortunately, this is not part of your high school graduation, so I, you don't have normative data, so you don't know when you see a person in their 30 or 40 if when they were 18 or 20, what it was. So women can be as fast as the mid 90s. Men can be also occasionally, at least upper 90s. The typical male is around 100 or just a little bit slower. Typical female is around 100 or faster. Neurofibromatosis type one, we see a lot of those here. And the VEP looks just like a patient with demyelination. If you show me VEPs of an affected neurofibromatosis patient, I couldn't tell you if it was an MS patient with the optic neuritis or because for completely different reasons, it produces the same thing. Slowing early on, uh, amplitude loss later on, if, but that's caused by the gliomas, not by demyelination. You get the same looking response. Essentially, all neurofibromatosis patients type 1 have slow responses by grade school, even if they don't have gliomas. There's just something else going on metabolically that slows the response. A little slow, not necessarily significantly slow, but say 110 or something like that. They have that in both eyes. Well, it's like MS. Usually the presentation, there one nerve is more affected than the other, which is usually related to the gliomas. But you don't have to have the gliomas to get the slowing. I've tested, I, I don't keep count, way more than 50. I'm probably following 30 now, or something between all the pediatric uh, specialists we have here. I followed some that have come and gone. I started when they were three. I watched them grow up and then last saw them when they were 16 or 18 years old or something. And, and they, they drove in themselves, you know, and, and I tested them. Okay, here's the bad news. Initial VEP of a patient, just real slow one eye only. Three years later with growth of gliomas on both nerves and four years later, just really nothing. No, no recordable visually evoked response on the left and just the semblance of one on the right. But this is not common. The, the, the typical average patient will have slowing but don't develop the gliomas to the extent that, that this happens. So I'm gonna run through some different other uh, diagnoses. Anything that messes with the optic nerve pathways, the central projections through the geniculate and thalamus, projections to the visual cortex or the cortical area itself, such as from meningitis or uh, anoxia, uh, near-death drowning, birth anoxia, anything along there will affect the visually evoked re response. The differential interpretation depends on the history. You're not going to mix up a meningitis patient with a hydrocephalus patient, et cetera. It's an orbital mass. This was a patient of Dr. Patel's. Let's see if I have a follow-up on this one. Oh, yeah. So beforehand, there was essentially no recordable response on the right side and a tiny one on the left. And then after decompression, a little bit of a visually evoked response came back on on there, right? and I didn't follow these people forever, so I don't know, because I just, I do what I'm told to do, so 
usually just one recording is done a few months after or something like that, then I don't see them anymore. So the visually evoked response, like the ERG and the multifocal ERG, can used, be used to quantitate progression in either direction, either recovery or, on, or pathology progression. Neuroblastoma, left side, orbital fracture left, pale optic nerve, slow and loss of amplitude, with ambutal nerve toxicity. This was a 30-something year old adult, I believe. It doesn't, it doesn't have his age on here. Again, if you showed him this, oh, it could be optic neuritis. You, so you can't make the, you can't say what the etiology is from, from visually evoked potentials. Because again, this one looks just like demyelination or neurofibromatosis. Slowing to 114, 116. Meningeal tuberculosis, again, just slowing, not much amplitude, little or no amplitude loss. Accardi syndrome, nasty. Really poor on one side. The other side is really okay. This was a small child that shows you the slow VEP, even though it has normal form and amplitude to it. Really really normal amplitude. This, you would only get numbers this size in children. Okay, and I've talked about multi, multifocal ectoretinograms. You can also do multifocal visually evoked potentials where you get 60 to 100 depending on the protocol. Again, same system is used, but the target is different. The target is this. I don't have a video uh, of it moving. Uh, they don't move, none of them move. They pop off and on in reverse. So this dartboard kind of pattern. Again, this was invented by the same guy, Eric Sutter, and the other companies that provide these systems use the same stimulus patterns. This is normal responses. Here's normal multifocals. Red is for right, right and left eyes. Test one eye at a time. This is coming up as an episode of severe acute optic neuritis, obliterating the, uh, the v multifocal VEPs, and then they recover in amplitude, but the time delay remains. Once you have these episodes of demyelination, it's during the episodes that the VEPs will be the slowest, and then they will recover and get better, but they don't speed back up again, because once you lose the myelin, you've lost the speed. So the red trace, the very small trace in most cases, is this during this episode of acute optic neuritis. And then here's the recovery. Notice the amplitudes come back almost completely, but that the, the time, the red trace is a little bit further to the right in each case, and that's slowing because time goes by left to right. Ischemic optic neuropathy. And this shows this area there where there's a big difference between the traces. Optic nerve glioma shows the difference between the traces there. Just want to get you a feeling for all of this electrophysiology that there's lots of applications that you can use. In the case of the retina, the great is you can quantitate what's going on in the retina or confirm your expected diagnosis. And multifocals are really useful to follow, map, detect, and determine if it really is in the retina because you can get almost the same feel issues at each level in the system, the retina, the nerve, the central pathways, the projections, the cortex, and at the cortex. One of the great things about the multifocal that I didn't mention is you can tell immediately, is it in the retina or not? Because people with just complete hemonopsias or uh, large field loss, if it's not in the retina, the multifocal is going to be normal. 
And, and that's really useful in individuals, especially the neuro-ophthalmology patients when they get, get these dumps from the other specialties because we can't find it, send it to neuro, let them figure it out. We don't want to waste our, waste our time on it. Again, there's uh, chapters in Web Vision on visually evoked responses that include this and, and other diseases. And in general, the internet's a great source. There must be like 10 videos out there that are on either ERGs or visually evoked potentials by different people or different companies. So if you get interested enough and you need a cure for insomnia, you can uh, look at some of these. Or if you end up in one of the specialties where it's important to you, like pediatrics or retina or neuro-ophthalmology. Okay, again, switch. How are we doing on time? 11.45. 45, okay. Let's, um, let me do dark adaptation for sure. Oh, sorry. Dark adaptation should be somewhere there. Dark adaptation is rarely used. I use it most in studies, <laughs> just research studies. That, uh, until the last year or so, I've used the Goldman Weaker's dark adaptometer, which was the classic way to, to measure a person's dark adaptation curves. Looks like this. And inside the patient views, this pattern, which can be rotated 90 degrees to make sure the patient's not guessing, so just randomly the tester would rotate this stripe. The stripe, the white of the stripes blinks about once per second. You start off at zero, at complete blackness, and test the patients one eye at a time. You, the fixation point is 10 degrees off, off center which is the peak of your rods. Even though you're dominated by cones right in the fovea and out to about 10 degrees, the rods actually peak out within 10 degrees. It's not true that you know, the rods keep getting more and more and more and more. They just dominate more and more and more as you get out. But, so a person can see this stripe best if they fixate on the red spot and just pay attention to what's going on right below it. The patient is asked to tell or tap a coin when they see it, stop tapping the coin or tell, tell the tester when it, when it appears and disappears. And over a period of 30 to 45 minutes, an individual will, after the first six or seven minutes, get a sharp break. This is called the cone break, even though it's the rods, it's called the cone break and improve about three logs over the next 30 to 40 minutes. This is the dark adaptation if you're just working on your cones. The principle of using colors is what I mentioned last time about ERGs. If you limit the stimulus to a really deep red, you can isolate the cones. If you limit the stimulus to a really dim deep blue, or peaking around 450 nanometers, you can just nick, nick the rods. So you can also do dark adaptations for just the rods and the cones separately. So this would be the target, the blue target below for the rods and the red target below for just the cones. Here it's just, this shows the differences if you use a red target versus the blue target in the dark adaptation. Now, these programs are done with uh, LED stimulation and the modern Gonsfelds instead of the Goldman Weakers, which, which was just uh, a brightness and a, and, a, and a blinking light. And these are completely automated. You just get the patient going. They push a button like doing a Humphrey Field when they see it. And the program knows if the patient pushes a button and sees it, it knows to make it a little dimmer. And then when the patient quits pushing the button that they don't see it, it makes it a little bit brighter. And it just 
changes this and produces the same kind of curves over whatever time period you wish. Most people use a minimum of 30 minutes, some use as long as an hour. Do I have one here? This is the system I'm using currently. It gives you two different curves because the stimuli alternate between red and green or blue. And these are the, the, the person pushing, the, pushing their automated buttons over a period of an hour. Here's a patient with liver disease. This was a patient of Bernstein's and he had uh, not very much small intestine and it's not the same patient I talked about last week in the ERGs. This is another individual. Um, but uh, prior to vitamin A therapy, he essentially had no night vision. The red curve is the normal curve and those, the, other, the other two curves are two months on vitamin A therapy and four months on vitamin A therapy. He had essentially a completely dysfunctional liver. He was on the liver transplant list, and he also had very, very little small intestine, so he couldn't absorb well. What is this? Oh, huh. That's, it's an albino that grew up here, lives in San Francisco now. I've used him for a lot of studies. In fact, the, Names. Albinos have better night vision than normal individuals. More light gets in their eye. Uh, he told me a story that he was with friends. They hiked up Mill Creek Canyon at dusk, so they were, by the time they got up at the top where they were headed, it was completely dark. And they decided for fun they would race back to the car. Well, he was back at the car eating sandwiches before anybody else because everybody else was running into tree limbs and falling off the, running off the trail. And to him, it was like dusk. And he would just run down the trail just like he came up the trail. <laughs> and uh, these are some individuals of, of the old classification of the tie-negative tie albinos and tie-positive. Those the tie-negative are the really white kind like Dale. He was exceptional in a lot of ways. You see, he's got not exceptional that he has a little stir business, but his vision was 2040 or better. And he was this type of albino. It's really rare for this type of albino to have that good a vision and be able to get a driver's license. He finally did give up driving when he got older. He's now, oh, he's at least over 50 now. And he's quit driving. Okay, that's it. Okay. Well.